welcome to the next chapter of our Velo virtual series. Uh, this one's repeatable, reliable, and scalable, and we've also subtitled it How to Industrialize Metal AM. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this one today. I think this is going to be a good one. Uh, this is a big theme for a Velo right now. Uh, as, as a lot of our customers start to move from project or prototyping work into scale production. Um, I do want to give credit for the title of this session. Uh, it actually came from a session that we were attending uh, at a manufacturing industry summit put on by ASME a couple of months ago. And during the keynote panel, they uh, had a session titled Industrializing AM, uh, Shared Challenges and Opportunities for Aerospace and Energy. And it, I think it was uh, one of the panelists was Hoka Schultz from Airbus. And he was asked, what is an industrialized additive manufacturing solution? Uh, so his reply, you can probably guess, had something to do with reliable, repeatable, and upscalable. So that's where we got the title from this. Uh, so thank you to uh, Mr. Schultz for that. Um, you know, this was an aha moment for us. Uh, and, and so we kind of wrote that down. Just thinking about what goes on behind the closed doors at Velo, giving you an insider peek uh, and some of the progress we've been making. Um, you know, we talk a lot about innovative geometries. We talk a lot about supply chain flexibility, and those subjects do bring interest from the industry, and they do start the conversations. Uh, but moving forward, especially with the customers as, as they evolve from project to production, uh, the main driver for their success is the ability to leverage and to be able to provide them uh, with the leverage for an on-demand digital supply chain. So um, you may have seen some PR talking about contract manufacturing partner network. Uh, that's obviously a big part of this. Um, but we're going to dive into sort of the technical background to this a little bit more in this session. So, um, so now, um, with no further ado, let me introduce our speaker. So it's an honor to introduce Will. Um, Will, how long have we been working together? Like two and a half years now, two years now? Uh, two, two years, yeah. Two years, awesome. It's been yeah. a little while. Uh, and we've done a lot of speaking sessions, so um, always great to work with Will on these types of uh, events. Uh, Will has over 15 years of design and systems engineering and some of the coolest technologies on the planet, jet engines, race cars, additive manufacturing. So uh, pretty awesome work there. Uh, prior to being an engineer, uh, he was operating nuclear power plants for the U.S. Navy. So thanks for your service there. Uh, another really cool uh, application. Uh, Will holds a BS in Aerospace Engineering from Embry-Riddle Aeronautics University and an MS in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Cincinnati. With over 18 patents, uh, he is a registered professional engineer in the state of Ohio and is fluent in both English and French. And uh, we, we've definitely done a couple calls where I've seen that French talent. So, um, Will, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Outstanding. Thanks for the intro, Mike. All right. So today we're going to talk about realizing a dream. And the, the dream is having a series of Metal AM printers distributed throughout the world in local regions. And then you can take a part file and you can uh, send the part file to whichever printer is closest to where the, the demand signal is. And you basically have that part printed locally on the printer and you get the part where you need it and when you need it. However, when we're looking at the conventional AM systems out there, there's really some difficulties that are encountered when trying to scale technologies that was that were really meant for the prototyping industry or printing parts in a lab, and you're trying to really scale it on a global scale. So if we look at the workflow here, you first start off generally with conventional metal AM systems with a CAD file. It then has to be converted to an STL file. You then pull in the STL files into your print preparation software. You have to fix uh, translation issues off, oftentimes with STLs, flip triangles, et cetera. And then after the build file is prepared, you then have to slice the build file. And at this point, you need to know which printer serial number you're going to be printing it on. And you also need to know uh, what calibration, what's the calibration state of that specific printer. Because the, the print file oftentimes is used to take out the slop or the, the variation in the optics for each printer. And so this creates a very cumbersome situation. Um, for instance, you have a lot of files that you have to track if you're in a highly regulated industry. Additionally, if a technician goes home over the weekend or say takes a few days off during his time off, the field service engineer comes out and calibrates the optics on one of these systems. He comes back, he can't use that print file from last week because will then uh, be printing faulty parts on an uncalibrated system 
if the laser has been recalibrated during his time off. So it, this can create a lot of confusion, a uh, very precarious situation uh, just when you when you reach serial production with this. Additionally, you'll notice that there's three months between calibrations in this uh, example, three to six months is common. And the problem with that is it, it uh, opens up a door of creating a lot of parts at risk, uh, parts that can be printed on uncalibrated systems. So that's a lot of risk um, brought to the supply chain. And then finally, there's a lot of variation in these systems. And we're gonna talk a lot today about uh, printer to printer variation as well as variation throughout the build. And with these legacy systems, uh, not only are, is there a lot of builds that have to be done to qualify the printer, also each part has to be qualified on that printer oftentimes as well, just to characterize the variation of the unstable process. So at the end of the day, this creates a situation where it's precarious to roll out just across the site. When you start looking at this on a worldwide level, it really becomes a, an impossible task. So next we, we take a step back to think, okay, how do we crack the code on reliable and scalable metal AM? And Velo 3D solution to this is really creating a full stack solution. So here you have our three main products, the Flow print pre preparation software, the Sapphire family of printers, and the Assure Quality validation software. And this, this is really a process flow here across from left to right on the screen. So you can see a CAD, uh, the native CAD file is pulled into the Flow software. This is where supports are added, process overrides, a Velo build file is created, and then a Velo print file is created after the part is sliced. And this Velo print file is uh, able to be used on any Sapphire printer worldwide. And then, um, you know, once, once uh, it's time to print on that Sapphire, the Sapphire is calibrated. We'll talk about these uh, calibrations today. And then finally, in the Assure Quality Validation software, we have 970 different sensors that are logging real-time data. And we're basically um, looking through that and logging it and monitoring it and uh, Assure and giving unprecedented insight into the build process uh, throughout the build. So the three key pieces of the puzzle that we'll be talking about is first off, having a series of qualification builds and weekly calibrations to make sure the tools are healthy and you have consistency across the fleet of sapphires. Secondly, we'll be talking a lot about Velo print files. And the reason we will be is because this is about driving part traceability through having a single print file versus a series of, of print files. And really the, the reason this is so critical is having the same laser instructions always being sent to the printer to, uh, to have the exact same part printed. And then finally, having one system of record for part print files for all sites. And this, this is really the scalability aspect to it. So not just having a consistent consistency in your factory at one site, it's about having a, a distributed supply chain uh, that you can leverage. So first off to talk about machine qualification, uh, this is just a, a high level before we dive into the details. So there's a variety of um, qualification builds that we'll be discussing. The first is a site acceptance test. Uh, this is really a Velo, Velo 3D generated build file to determine the tool is healthy and operating within spec. Next, we have the Sapphire qualification build. So this is uh, OEM, an OEM derived build where basically there's a, oftentimes a material database that already exists and basically buys the Sapphire, uh, specific Sapphire serial number into that existing material database. And then finally, there's a part qualification build. And this is the actual Velo print file that's used in production. And this is basically analogous to a first article inspection that is common um, with standard conventionally produced parts as well. And then underneath it all, what's tying it all together is making sure that we don't have consistency or it's ensuring that we have consistency in um, avoiding variation across the across the fleet. And so through this, we have optical calibrations, uh, thermal sensor calibrations, and um, powder bed quality verified weekly across the entire fleet of sapphires. Now, looking here at the site acceptance test. Um, so this is 
this right here on the right side of the screen, you can see this is our um, so this is our site acceptance test build, and coincidentally, it's also the factory acceptance test build. So we we have this build that we run before every Sapphire leaves the factory, as well as when it's installed at its final location. And so if we look here, there's a variety of um, of uh, aspects that we're validating. So first off, dimensional accuracy around the perimeter of the build plate is being verified here. Next, we have a process tree in the middle of the build plate. This is being made with both lasers at a variety of angles and basically pushing the processes to their limit to, because it's, it's at the limit of a process that you see variation um, if, if variation is going to occur. Uh, next, you have tensile properties. So you can see as printed and as machine tensile bars for each laser. Um, material density or lack of porosity is also verified. And then finally, surface finish is uh, verified on uh, several parts um, throughout, scattered around the build plate. Uh, this is basically the geometries that the uh, Velo 3D process engineering team has deemed as the, the most challenging to ensure that we're, um, that the tool is operating well within spec even at some more challenging geometries. So once the site acceptance test is complete, the customer signs off that in fact, the, the results are satisfactory as well. Uh, we have a report out to the customer there. And then finally, we move to the Sapphire qualification build. So this is the OEM derived build that um, it, it really varies for us customer to customer because we have, um, you know, some customers are designed jet engines rocket engines, um, turbo machinery, all sorts of variety of applications. And different applications have different design requirements. And because of that, different material properties want, are being validated in these builds. So that, that's what drives the, the variation from OEM to OEM. Typically, these are a mix of laser one, laser two, two and dual laser specimens. And just have a, a list here of what we commonly see with these. So uh, tensile properties are basically always there. Um, oftentimes designs are limited by fatigue. And so fatigue is often verified. Toughness is uh, comes up as well. Um, and then generally there's always a process cube in there for verifying the uh, lack of porosity in the microstructure, uh, chemistry, surface finish and dimensional accuracy. This is a little redundant with a site acceptance test build but uh, many OEMs want to just have that, that level of consistency where they're tracking it on their Sapphire machine or Sapphire qualification uh, build reports as well. So now we'll talk a little bit about Sapphire, or excuse me, uh, laser power bed fusion sources of variation. So there's a variety of problems that are common in the industry with other systems, and that drives a lot of uh, rigor and extra builds that are uh, in, in order to characterize a process that isn't necessarily stable. And part the first step in qualifying a process is making sure the, the process is stable because processes that are stable are easier to characterize and qualify. So the first two are variations in the uh, X and Y direction or across the build plane. And then the last two are variations in the uh, vertical direction or the, the Z, Z direction. So first off in the X direction, or, um, X and Y direction, we have gas flow inconsistencies. Dead zones are a common problem. We have consistent uh, gas flow across our chamber. We don't have any obstructions like recoders in the way, et cetera. Uh, additionally, um, laser incidence angle can cause variation across the build plate and for our for the Velo 3D processes, they are qualified not and developed not only on, directly underneath the laser, but also at the extremities of the build plate, so that uh, day in day out you don't see that variation um, as, with respect to location. Uh, next, there's um, so commonly there's build plate heating or powder bed pre-centering or uh, build build chamber heating that occurs in other systems. And this can cause uh, variation in 
the Z direction with material properties, you get larger grains towards the bottom, smaller towards the top. Um, at, with Abello 3D though, uh, with our Sapphire, there's no heated build plates. There's no preheating of powder. Uh, it is where we, and we do this in order to drive uniformity uh, throughout the build volume. And then also uh, another common problem is if you're working with heavier alloys such as Inconel 718, you can have uh, frame flexing um, as, as a function of the powder hopper level. So when the, the machine is full of powder, the frame flexes down and the laser spot can move. And then if you refill the powder hopper, then it, it moves again. And so this, is, uh, uh, this makes it very challenging to characterize. However, if we look at the Velo 3D Sapphire, uh, there's no load path between the powder hoppers and the main frame. Um, and so there, there's no, uh, it's not a stressed member. So because of that, uh, we don't encounter this problem either. So, um, you know, that's those, that previous slide was more about overall machine design, uh, printer design. This is, but then there's other sources of variation that we um, basically uh, work to calibrate each Sapphire uh, to. And all of these calibrations that we're about to talk about, these are all done with the push of a button with a technician, by, by a technician who is actually operating the, the Sapphire day in, day out, not, not a field service engineer. So the first one is beam stability. Uh, this is basically verifying that the optical train is clean and when the, if, if there exists an optical train, then the spot will move uh, as, as the optical train heats up, uh, the debris will heat up and cause variation with respect to time and temperature. So we, tune, we verify for that with beam stability. Next we have um, spot diameter or laser focus. So we're basically verifying the spot diameter does not change as a function of location on the build plane. So we're verifying the spot diameter at 49 different locations across the build plane. Next we have laser alignment. So we're doing laser distortion mapping on each galvo. And then uh, we also um, map the, the two lasers to each other at 500 different points across the build plane and basically ensure that the, the laser spots are uh, coincident with each other. Uh, next we, uh, calibrate the thermal sensor offset to ensure that we're getting a, a strong heat signal uh, or thermal signal from the, the uh, melt pool. And then finally, uh, we have uh, some really unique capabilities relative to the powder bed verification. So first off, we have a 3D topographical map of the powder bed that, um, that oftentimes we call height mapper. We can use this to basically verify powder bed flatness. So this makes sure that you have a consistent layer of powder across the powder bed, and um, it, which is important because basically the powder is your feedstock in a welding process. So you need to make sure you have a consistent amount of uh, feedstock um, as, as you're welding. And then also we're able to look for erosion events. So erosion events can occur if there's a problem with the gas flow where it's basically eroding away the powder bed. Uh, so we verify for that as well. So all these calibrations together, these are done weekly uh, by a technician, as I was saying, and there we find them key to ensuring that there's not uh, variations in the, in the build across sapphires. So now we'll, I'd like to show you a couple of different plots because we, we just talked about consistency and uh, in and out. And you see right here, this is consistency across the build plate in the X and Y direction. Um, these, these are TIE 6 4 ELI um, bars that were tested. Um, we have ultimate tensile strength, yield strength, and elongation. And you're, we're basically seeing, um, you know, there's a very tight distribution for each of these. And maybe just to explain the plot just a little bit more, uh, to make sure everyone understands what we're looking at. I'll, I'll talk us through the UTS here. So this is the Y direction of the uh, build plate. This is the X direction of the build plate. We have a 300, um, 350, uh, 315 millimeter diameter build plate. Uh, so that's what 
these dimensions that you're seeing here on each plot. Um, when you look at these, uh, really a couple of key things. First, all of the um, values are well above the spec minimum. Uh, in this case, ASTM F3001. Additionally, uh, you can see there's um, really no clear trends of variation across the build plate. And we're also getting a very tight, nice tight distribution across the plot. So uh, very high values, tight distribution, and you're not seeing any, any trends. Um, additionally, looking at the variation in the, in the Z axis. So we, we get a lot of questions about uh, whether, whether it's uh, variation due to height in the build volume or also free floating or non free floating parts. So free floating parts are not connected to build plate. This is a unique capability that Velo 3D has to your non-contact recoders. So basically what we're doing with uh, the plots here is we're verifying, um, you can see here on the left side of the screen, uh, a layer of um, attached bars to the build plate, a layer of uh, free floating bars above that, and then also laser one, laser two, and dual laser bars. Um, dark blue is the attached and first layer um, the light blue is the free floating or the second layer. And you can see uh, consistency both in the average and the minus three sigma properties between these, these uh, two different data sets. So now we'll uh, take a look at part qualification because now we've talked to having a consistent fleet of sapphires. Uh, worldwide, but the next aspect is ensuring that the part itself is meeting requirements. So with the part qualification build, uh, this is basically verifying that all the processes working in tandem are uh, working together correctly. So at, at this point, we're working with the actual Velo print file that will be used in production throughout the, the production life of the part. So the and, and really, at the end of the day, this is basically a first article print. Um, so with that, similar to other, uh, with, with standard first articles for con conventionally made parts, you have dimensional accuracy, surface finish, um, and cutups as well to verify lack of porosity. So cutups are common as well, first time you have a forging or a casting, uh, and it's similar here. Additionally, um, with each, with each part, uh, generally there's uh, two tensile bars, a process cube and a powder sample that is taken at the same time just to verify quality of build uh, that are added on. Um, and so bear with me here as we talk a little bit more about the, the details of the flow preprint software and we'll talk more about the, the Velo print file and the significance of of what's going on here, because it's really locking down the directions of how that part is produced. So first off, we have with flow two different uh, portions of flow. The first is the build preparation portion, and the next is the process review portion. Uh, so with flow build preparate, uh, with the build prep, basically the CAD file is pulled in, the part is oriented and then supported. We then apply process override. So process overrides is say for instance, if you want no contour passes to occur on a certain surface, that would, uh, that's where, where uh, that those directions are applied by the user or manufacturing engineer. Uh, and then the build plate is populated. So you, you do this for one part and say you want to produce 10 parts on a build plate, you then array them around on the build plate. Next, um, the file is the build, the build file is sliced. And as slicing occurs, it's basically taking the geometry and slicing it into 2D sections. And then if we look over on the right side of the screen here, you can see uh, a variety of different parameter sets. So uh, we have over two dozen different parameter sets per material at Velo 3D, a very extensive uh, library. And you can see right here, for instance, you have a bulk parameter, you have vertical walls, um, lattice, low angle walls, and really what is occurring is uh, based on the geometry, it's a different thermal environment and a different thermal input that needs to be applied 
to that specific geometry. So the flow software is um, taking a very sophisticated look at the geometry and basically uh, as it cuts up the, or slices the, the geometry, it's determining which of these process sets uh, needs to be applied for each specific uh, location on the part. And then from there, the laser instructions are generated and then um, the Velo print file is created. Um, the Velo print file has been opened up in the process review and the manufacturing engineer will review the prepared file, uh, the prepared print file, just as a final verification before it's uh, sent out to the printer, just to make sure that processes were applied. There is no uh, you know, obvious issues with, with how the part sliced. So now if we look back to back of the conventional or other metal AM systems versus fellow 3D and this workflow here, you can see it's greatly simplified. You have a multitude of files on the top. On the bottom with fellow 3D, you basically have your CAD file that's already been created. You then bypass uh, having any STLs to, to track. You then have the Velo build file that's created. And then regardless of printer serial number, regardless of um, which calibration uh, has occurred for to the optics, you have one single Velo print file for all Sapphires worldwide. So from a part traceability standpoint, this is a, a night and day difference. And so we'll, I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the significance of this because now that we've locked down all of the laser parameters uh, into one file, it's important to validate that file. And it really is mimicking, the process mimics that of the first article inspection um, kind of methods that already exist with conventionally manufactured and conventionally designed parts today. So the, there's three different uh, types of defects that we find in first article inspections. Uh, first is surface defects. So these are visual to the eye. Um, a couple of different drivers here. Perhaps um, you know it's the geometry is too low of an angle, uh, so we've just you know been too aggressive. A lot of a lot of times we have customers they love having far fewer supports than uh, other systems out there, and sometimes they get a little over ambitious. Um, and uh, but you know no worries there. You can basically if this occurs, you can either adjust the angle in the design or else. Add a, um, some supports or apply different processes to overcome this, these issues. Um, next, uh, low angles can be more challenging when you're farther away from the laser. So um, while we develop our processes to uh, work throughout the build plate uh, or across the build plate, um, still you can, you can come across some extreme cases where um, you start to see laser normal effects at the extremities of the build plate. Um, and then uh, additionally, geometric deformations. So un unconstrained geometry or you have high residual stresses. Sometimes if you have a, you know, a thin tube, tube with a very large lug at the top of it, you're gonna see some uh, deformation there, things of that nature. And then also with large diameter parts, there will be some uh, thermal shrinkage that occurs so um, that's another thing to keep an eye out for. And then finally, uh, lack of fusion porosity. So uh, we've come across this a couple times in first article inspections. The first one is uh, we had a case where uh, we had a layer of uh, lack of fusion defects that occurred due to incorrectly applied processes. Uh, it was consistent. There was uh, of the 10 parts in the build, uh, the they were cut up and they consistently have the exact same <clears throat> uh, uh, lack of fusion porosity on the exact same layer. Uh, when we looked at it further, it was um, uh, incorrectly applied process. We fixed that in the uh, Velo build file, resliced the file, uh, reprinted it, cut it up, and um, the lack of fusion uh, porosity was gone. Uh, the other one um, was last year we had an issue where it was basically a perfect storm that occurred where a bunch of compounding aggravators um, in, in a build 
created a um, lack of fusion defect at a very specific location. And through the, as we work to remedy this problem, uh, we reproduced the exact same pore on 20 different parts, 20 different builds, I should say, 20 different unique builds across four different alloys. And it was uh, tremendously aggravating <laughs> to have that many attempts to address a, a problem, uh, but we finally fixed it. And the reason I like to bring this up is because when you have, uh, when you're consistently creating uh, the same problem in a, um, in a controlled environment, that means you can have a repeatable solution. So at the end of the day, our uh, process engineering and software engineering teams uh, developed a solution that made us stronger. We've rolled out improvements in our processes as well as software because of this obscure corner case to make sure that not only ha doesn't happen on that part, but it doesn't happen on uh, when similar situations occur going forward. Um, and, you know, after now that's finally fixed, the parts that now that part is being, um, when that part is produced, then um, the, the lack of fusion defect no longer is uh, occurring. And, um, you know, really to, to drive the point home, this is why our customers continue to take this uh, first article inspe inspection approach. The very nice thing about working with fellow 3D's uh, ecosystem is when a defect occurs, it's repeatable. And so when you have the fix, it's repeatable as well. Uh, and it's a, a nine day difference when you're chasing your tail with uh, part to part or build to build variation. Uh, it's, a, it's a breath of fresh air. So now we'll talk about fulfilling the dream of a scalable AM solution. And um, this is a, a bit of a tactical slide, but there's, uh, you know, most companies out there are now using PLM software as they control the configurations of their products. Um, it, this is where the CAD files are locked down, the drawing files are locked down, and it's basically a single source of truth or a, a system of record worldwide. And so what occurs here, if we just kind of look through the steps of going from concept or inception of the design to the uh, part being printed, you first have in a CAD software, the design engineer will release the design and lock down the model. And that's uploaded into the PLM system. From there, the manufacturing engineer pulls down the part file. He then loads into flow. Uh, creates the Velo build file after preparing the model. Um, so he, the manufacturing engineer will then slice the, the file and create a Velo print file. He'll verify that the Velo print file uh, looks acceptable and then uh, lock down both the Velo print file and the Velo build file and upload those onto the PLM system. So if you see a, you know, a common tree for a part number right here, the triple three two sixty five P O one will say, you can see there's a part file. This is a CAD file. You have a drawing file that's uh, on Rev two, and then you have Rev one of the build file, fellow build file, and Rev one of the fellow print file. And this is tremendously powerful because now anyone who has access to that PLM system can basically uh, pull down that fellow print file onto the Sapphire, and then um, start printing that part. So uh, really a, a night and day difference from um, the transferring files around with USB drives and et cetera. Um, so now talking about a couple of cases of how this is being implemented in the field. Um, we, with OEMs, uh, certain OEMs, they are bringing in uh, Sapphire in-house. They qualify the part in-house they, this is where they create the, the Velo print file. But with, um, as, as they grow and as the part is going from uh, concept or prototype to, or I should say development engines, development builds to um, full-blown serial production, uh, instead of um, just printing the parts in house, they're actually sending the Velo print file to uh, multiple contract manufacturers or suppliers um, across the world. And so this brings a, a very nice 
and consistent um, part um, part product or very consistent product back to them. They always get the exact same file. This is a night and day difference from sending a CAD file to a contract manufacturer who doesn't really want you to know how they support the part. There can be variations in orientation, all sorts of other things that would uh, that need to be validated. And for for um, flight hardware is just too difficult to substantiate or unsatisfactory. So having this single velo print file is tremendously powerful to drive consistency across your supply chain to make sure the part that you're printing in-house is also the same part as what you're ordering from a contract manufacturer. And so the, uh, just to finally close the loop on this, with the distributed supply chain, um, what, how, how this works is you basically have, if you are say one single company or entity, uh, you can then deploy sapphires throughout the world uh, where, uh, where you need them in the region that where the parts are needed. And then uh, pending that all the different sapphires have access to the same PLM system, then the order is sent to the uh, specific factory and region. They then pull down that specific fellow print file, flow down to their printer, they print the part and you have this worldwide consistency. Um, it's like the McDonald's model where the Big Mac in St. Louis is supposed to be the same Big Mac that you get in Budapest. So uh, anyway, it's a tremendously powerful concept and it, it's really, it's not just theoretical, this is uh, what we're seeing occurring today uh, across our customer base and a really exciting advancement for Metal AM as we shift from prototypes to serial production. So in summary, um, worldwide scalable AM is not a dream. It's occurring today. Uh, it's made possible through a series of site acceptance tests, sapphire quals, part quals, and really having this continuous, um, these uh, continuous calibrations that occur um, on a weekly basis. So really driving, locking down the, the process and um, you know, that's, that's what's driving this consistent part production. Um, it, the reason this is made possible as well is really our full stack solution at Velo 3D that drives the single print file concept. <clears throat> and then finally, um, these principles, they're heavily being in, influenced by the aerospace industry because the aviation and space industries are early movers uh, and additive, but really this applies to any industry where quality parts are, are necessary and required. And so the, the principles here are heavily influenced, but really going forward, uh, we expect this to be applied to, to any industry that's embracing metal AM for production. So with that, um, thanks for your attention. I, I'd like to now open it up for questions in the audience. All right, I can't hear you, Mike. Uh, there we go. It, it helps to have two, two mute buttons that you have to hit, hit it twice. Um, yeah, so no we are going to open it up for questions. And just to kind of uh, reiterate, we'll be monitoring the Q&A panel, not the chat panel. Um, so if I, I did see a question come in through the chat panel, if you could just copy it over into the Q&A, uh, we'll run through that. So, all right, um, a couple here. Uh, thank you for the interesting webinar. So good job. <laughs> Uh, the qualification standard shows a very high, or sorry, the qualification process, process shows a very high standard. How much time does the process take, especially when testing in the Z direction? Uh, so uh, Z direction build um, can, it, so it varies with uh, the height, I mean, and how many bars you can, it can be, let's say a five to seven day build for a full, full height. Z direction build. So because of this, we recommend, um, you know, based on experience, not necessarily doing full height uh, Sapphire qualification builds on a repetitive basis, but using the, the data that does come off when you do full height builds and using that to substantiate doing shorter qualification builds um, 
going forward so that you aren't using so much time and resources for just printing bars that are at the top of the build chamber. So, um, you know, generally five to seven days, but really as time uh, goes on, we're seeing a shift to doing uh, shorter builds. Um, even our site acceptance test builds used to be full height. And then when we saw the data and lack of variation, it seemed like a waste of resources to continue doing those long builds for no reason. Good, good question. There's another question here about qualifying new materials. Uh, could you maybe walk through Velo3D's process to qualify new materials? Yeah, absolutely. So for new materials, so our parameters are, uh, we develop our parameters in house. Um, if, so we have a variety of materials today, uh, INCO 718, INCO 625, um, TIE 64, Hesloy X, F357, aluminum, uh, and then we're also bringing on Scalmoy here shortly. If that, if you need a different material and you have a production need, uh, we will develop that as part of the uh, agreement for the purchase of the printer. Uh, that's not an extra cost. That's passed along to you. We'll work with you based on your requirements, um, and in order to develop the material um, to your satisfaction. Uh, there's slide 15. I think that was the one where you showed the tensile bar distribution. Um, sure. Right. This one. So this one's a new one for me too. Um, so the, the comment was, if the build plate is circular, why do the uh, graphs look uh, more like polygons than circles? Uh, so this is... Uh, um... These are jump plots, and so there's. It's just a function of the location of the um, of the tensile bars and the specific x y coordinates. And uh, maybe th there was a question here about how close we are to the uh, specification minimum, specifically to yield strength. Um, I noticed you have that labeled here as uh, less than seven ninety five. Um, and for some people, I know the colors on monitors might might vary. Maybe you could talk through where these bands are on this graph over here. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So if we look at the yield strength, uh, the lowest is in the 815 to 825 uh, uh, megapascal range, where the, um, the spec is uh, 795 uh, megapascals. Um, similarly, on ultimate tensile strength, we're in the um, 980 to above 1010 megapascals, uh, where 860 is the spec minimum. And then similarly, you can see 10% is the spec min on elongation, where we're in the 17% and above. It's really 17 to 24% uh, elongation. So. Uh, Good, good questions. It's always challenging to present data in a public forum in a way that makes sense uh, instantaneously. So uh, no worries on the questions. Are, are there any more on this slide, Mike, or should I? Those are the two. Uh, move back. Okay. Yeah, I, I do have a couple of questions on flow. Um, the first that, you know, can you use flow for other printers? Uh, Meaning other, okay, so... um, other manufacturing, <laughs> other printers for other, from other manufacturers. Yeah, so it's really important to use, first off, no. Um, <laughs> we uh, Flow works with the Sapphire and the Sapphire only works with Flow. And the reason that is, is because uh, there has to be this continuous, uh, throughout the development, we've had this continuous uh, feedback loop of the print results on the printer is what drives, whether it's machine upgrades, hardware upgrades, software upgrades, or process upgrades. It's really an ecosystem and you can't separate one, uh, the software from the hardware and vice versa. And that's really also enabled us, you know, we're well known for being able to print uh, crazy geometries. And the reason we're able to do that is because of uh, having the software and hardware integration. So we don't have that barrier um, between the software and hardware that uh, other systems out there have. And regarding flow or maybe in the VeloPrint uh, file itself, does it allow for serialization or marking? 
Uh, so that's uh, something we've been requested and we're uh, working on still. Uh, right now, a lot of the marketing occurs um, in, on the CAD file side, but um, certainly that's something under development. There are a couple of questions here with regard to uh, the PLM. You showed kind of a network going to different places on the globe. Uh, and there were some questions around security uh, of the PLM system. And, and so maybe, could, can you walk us sort of through what that slide mean, you know, what, what's the context around that slide maybe? Yeah, so it, with the PLM, um, you know, there's software, so I'm not an IT guy. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it, but basically it, it's, you know, having a single network where all the different uh, organizations and uh, um, in a company can reference this, this common software platform. So to be clear, the, the intention here with the PLM um, you know, we're, we haven't mentioned any specific names for the PLM software. Uh, the idea, though, is that um, basically, you know, anyone design products out there has a PLM system where they're, it's a single resource for their CAD files and their drawing files. And what the nice thing is, is with uh, Velo 3D's single build file and single print file, it, um, it, it can basically leverage this existing system, your existing ecosystem for configuration control and not having another add-on piece of software to track your build files and print files on top of the other system. So it, it basically just, we can fit right in homogeneously with, with um, the system you already have in-house today. Yeah, so we're not providing this network and the security is kind of up to the customer. Correct. Yeah. Um, now there were some questions about uh, different powder suppliers with regard to this network and like how sensitive is the uh, Velo 3D solution to different powder suppliers? Uh, so um, we're, we're powder agnostic. So uh, the contract manufacturer or OEM who purchases the system, they determine which powder is loaded. Um, so from there, when the, when the, Sapphire is on the factory floor at, at uh, Velo 3D. We load it with that powder. We do the factory acceptance tests um, with that powder. And then that's what's loaded again when it arrives at the facility for the site acceptance test as well. So it's, it's customer driven. And no. what, I think I might've already said this, but we are powder agnostic. So we do not, uh, and we do not sell powders. Uh, and so with the, there was a question here about the Velo print file. When you send that out and, um, you know, are, are, is this the exact same processing conditions for each of these printers in that case? And how do you uh, ensure that all the printers are going to behave the same given the same instructions? Yeah. So the reason the printers um, that we specific, specifically have created the uh, site acceptance test build and uh, machine calibration um, uh, routines basically to verify that the sapphires themselves are performing consistency consistently across the fleet. And then additionally, uh, from the OEM side, they have their additional qualification builds uh, that they overlay on top of that in order to have yet another level of verification that the uh, sapphires are working correctly across the fleet. Is there any restriction in terms of the powder shape, like gas or plasma atomized, or, or particle distribution uh, size? I guess as well. Yeah, so there's um, there's uh, we've run both gas and plasma atomized powder, um, so um, there's um, no issues there. There's uh, certainly flowability is key, uh, part of. The um, and also with particle size distribution, we use standard particle size distributions um, for Encano 718, for instance, 1545 PSD. Um, you generally want to stick with that. With um, If you don't, then you can have some sieve problems where you're throwing out uh, good powder, <laughs> sieving out good powder. Uh, and then additionally, um, with... Uh, the lighter alloys such as titanium or aluminum, you slightly have a little bit larger 
PSD, say like 2063 PSD or things of that nature. And that's common just because the flowability has an inverse relationship with the, um, the density of the material. So you want to make sure it flows well and, and consistently. Okay. Um, does, does the printer or uh, does the Velo solution provide any kind of qualification for the part that was printed? Any kind of reports for um, that, yeah. that happened after the part? Uh, absolutely. So with Assure, so we have a whole other presentation on Assure uh, that in and of itself is another probably 40 minutes. Um, but part of that, what's covered in that is all the different uh, quality validation um, uh, or the, the quality validation software. So we have control charts, heat maps, uh, uh, 3D images of the, or basically topographical images of the powder bed, all sorts of other uh, aspects that's going on from the part verification side of things as well um, in conjunction with this. Uh, just for brevity, we <laughs> had to mm -hmm. had to keep the subject a little focused here to, to get through. Uh, yeah, I would say that there are a lot of questions on post-processing. We just finished a webinar at the end of March with uh, Duncan Machine Products, one of our contract manufacturing network partners, and we dive into all of the uh, post-processing and kind of pre-processing that goes into a single part. So what, what I, if you have any questions around that, um, please check out that webinar. And I, I'll, I'll just answer probably four or five of these with the, the it depends. Um, for any of your post-processing, that, that's kind of the easiest answer is it, it's going to depend on what the requirements are for the part. Um, but definitely check that out and, and see um, what the time is involved for each of the steps. We, we walk through it in that session as well. It's another like 30, 35 minute discussion. All right. Uh, do we have any design guides? Uh, yeah, so we have the Velo 3D design guides. Uh, we have a series of YouTube videos as well where we uh, discuss these. But yeah, with uh, because we don't run into the recoder clash issues because we have a non-contact recoder as well as we're able to print at much lower angles than 45 degrees, um, generally down to 0 to 10 degrees based on the geometry. Um, there's the residual stress and the, the structure uh, stability plays a greater role. So we have several plots out there of um, minimum angle as a function of geometry shape. Um, and that helps um, design engineers and ma manufacturing engineers alike to um, really get the optimal solution from Velo3D's um, technology. We have a couple questions here. Do we have um, any partners in Europe? We, we do. Um, we have a company called CRP Mechanica, who is a distributor of Velo 3D Sapphires in Europe. They can also uh, give you some information if you're interested in parts. Um, and we have a partner, Excelencia, who works out of Spain. So either one of those companies, if you want to talk to them, you can talk to them about your part applications or if you're interested in a Sapphire printer. And it, um, I will send out a couple links in the follow on here. One with the uh, Duncan Machine Products webinar that we just talked about. I, I did see a note on that. Um, and then uh, a couple other ones as well. The um, uh, Innovator's Guide to Metal AM, we have a webinar on that. So I'll, I'll make sure to include that one in the follow up so that you can get that information. I guess the last question um, any, any closing thoughts um, in, in terms of the content? I think we're kind of up on the hour right now. So we'll, we'll wrap it up with that. I, yeah, I'd just like to say, you know, thanks for everyone who uh, joined the session today. This is a really exciting uh, point in Middle AM as we're shifting from prototypes to production. Um, many parts out there are already flying and just it's going to only increase with time and uh, really nailing down this qualification, uh, these qualification aspects is key to making sure that industry and the technology continues to uh, impact lives and not just stay in the lab. So. Thanks again for your time today.